morning, BFC family, and welcome to Wisdom from the Word for June 19th. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Mark chapter 11. When Jesus dispensed his wisdom, he would typically use words. But in this particular story, I think uh, you'll see that Jesus' actions spoke much more loudly than his words. So let's see what he has to say. Okay, starting with verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its immense wisdom. We thank you for showing us event by event in life that when we apply your word and your wisdom to our lives, it works, even in a broken world. Father, help us to understand. Give us the hunger to apply it and give us to rejoice when, you, when we see you work in and through your word. And this thanks we give in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus enters the temple. The temple is considered a very holy place and considered by many of the Jews to be the house of God. Now, to put that term in perspective, is this really God's house? I mean, can man build anything that would house God? God said himself, I created this planet. Are you going to make a house for me? Okay, so it's, it's not his house, but it is a facility that he uses for a purpose. And as Jesus' statement here is, you know, I, I've got this for prayer. I've got this so that you can come and commune with me. But Jesus goes in and trashes the place. So what's that about? Does, does, you know, on, on the face of it, a lot of people would think that means he's disrespecting the facility and he's disrespecting who owns it. But we know Jesus' thoughts are a lot higher than our own, so try to understand what it is that he's doing. It's, it's fairly clear that whatever trashing he's doing is this facility, it does not defile the place nearly as much as what was already going on in the temple. Now, the reason I bring this up with our family here is that, uh, as you know, we're, we're, we're seeking to produce a new facility. We want to move into a, a, a bigger, better facility so that our children's and youth ministries can expand because we're literally being overrun in a lot of cases. And that's a good problem to have. But what I want to do is make sure that everybody has this facility in their minds in the right perspective. Hopefully it's going to be big, hopefully it's going to be useful, and, and maybe even beautiful. But the tendency for humans is that as soon as we do that, we start almost worshiping the facility. And we, we become concerned about what happens to the facility rather than keeping our mind on what was the facility for in the first place. I think that's what Jesus was doing, was saying, stop, think about what this facility was meant to be in the first place and go back to what it's supposed to be. So applying that to what we might see in the future as, as our BFC family gets into a new facility, I would like to read a parable. And this parable isn't out of the Bible. Um, this parable was written by a person named Chuck Swindoll. And he brings to mind the idea of what tends to happen to groups of people when they start being concerned, more concerned for the facility than they do for the people that the facility is supposed to minister to. 
we are going to be having teenagers and children in this new facility and there are going to be times when it's going to get trashed and there will be people who like to see the facility be clean and pristine and there's nothing wrong with that but sometimes that leads to forgetting what the ministry is about in the first place so we want to stay focused on those who we're ministering to and those who are ministering directly to those who need to be saved and need to be discipled, they're busy. So I would hope that we would act as a team. And if you have the privilege of being able to clean up the messes behind those who are being rescued and those who are doing the rescuing, that you would count that as a privilege and, and as part of being in the team that BFC is meant to have and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So. Allow me to read this parable. Parable of the Lighthouse. On a dangerous sea coast notorious for shipwrecks, there was a crude little life-saving station. Actually, it was merely a hut with only one boat, but the few members kept a constant watch over the turbulent sea. With little thought for themselves, they would go out day and night tirelessly searching for those in danger as well as the lost. Many lives were saved by this brave band who faithfully worked as a team in and out of the life-saving station. By and by, it became a famous place. Some of those who had been saved, as well as others along the seacoast, wanted to become associated with this little station. They were willing to give their time, energy, and money in support of its objectives. New boats were purchased, new crews were trained. The station, once obscure and crude and virtually insignificant, began to grow. Some of its members were unhappy the hut was so unattractive and poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided. Emergency cots were replaced with lovely furniture, Rough, handmade equipment was discarded, and sophisticated, classy systems were installed. The hut, of course, had to be torn down to make room for all the additional equipment, furniture, and systems. By the time of its completion, the life-saving station had become a popular gathering place, and its objectives had begun to shift. It was now used as a sort of clubhouse, an attractive building for public gathering. Saving lives, feeding the hungry, strengthening the fearful, and calming the disturbed rarely occurred. Fewer members were interested in braving the sea on life-saving missions, so they hired professional lifeboat crews to do this work. The original goal of the station wasn't altogether forgotten, however, Life-saving motifs still prevailed in the club's decorations. There was a liturgical lifeboat preserved in the Room of Sweet Memories with soft, indirect lighting, which helped hide the layer of dust upon the once-used vessel. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the boat crews brought in loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty, some terribly sick and lonely, others were different from the majority of the club members. The beautiful new club suddenly became messy and cluttered. A special committee saw to it that a shower house was immediately built outside away from the club so victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there were strong words and angry feelings which resulted in a division among the members. Most of the people wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities and all involvements with shipwrecked victims. As you'd expect, some still insisted on saving lives, that this was their primary objective, that their only reason for existence was ministering to anyone needing help, regardless of their club's beauty or size or decorations. They were voted down and told if they wanted to save the lives of various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So, they did. 
As the years passed, the new station experienced the same old changes. It evolved into another club, and yet another life-saving station was begun. History repeated itself. And if you visit that coast today, you'll find a large number of exclusive, impressive clubs along the shoreline owned and operated by slick professionals who have lost all involvement with the saving of lives. Shipwrecks still occur in those waters, but now most of the victims are not saved. Every day they drown at sea and so few others seem to care. So very few. Let's pray. Father of heaven, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for bringing each of us to where we could understand Christ. And, and thank you for the great grace you show to those of us who have placed our trust in him. Father, thank you for the lives that, that we enjoy now because of our King and our Christ. Father, give us hunger ever for sharing your message with the lost and the endangered and the lonely and the disturbed. Father, give us to, to overlook any messes that occur in the process of helping these people and give us to just enjoy what we see you doing in and through the BFC family and the changes in the lives that we see. Give us to have joy in watching that and give that joy to be contagious. And this we desperately ask in the name of our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week.